So, about a year ago, I released a dynamic shadow shader on the GMC, and it wasn't bad. Uh, the shader was decent. I mean, it did what it was supposed to do. It wasn't incredible. Uh, ran a little bit slowly, and um, I guess the main issue with it was the quality. Uh, the quality wasn't amazing. There was quite a large quality drop-off over range, and at the time, I just couldn't get my head around the other shadow methods. Um, I was using the most basic, straight out of the box uh, shadow method which involved rendering a cone frostum projection matrix, the standard one that you use for rendering any camera in a 3D scene, and using that to generate a shadow map. Funnily enough, the tutorial I was following had the clue to the solution the whole time, but at the, I, w I didn't really have a great enough understanding at the time to really be able to make the most of it. And uh, over the last couple of months, um, well, I've been working on my own project, my game Vitality, but uh, when I've had a bit of free time and uh, not necessarily too much time to do anything else, I've been doing a bit of reading and a uh, bit of learning. So I've been working on a number of different shader effects, just trying to understand the whole system a bit better. <laughs> when I first went in, I was going in quite blind and did really know exactly what I was doing with regard to shader programming and um, I mean I like it, shader programming is one of these things which is relatively straightforward, the actual shader part, the shaders aren't really complicated at all, it's about the, as bare bones as you could make syntax but what's nice is it's a language where the complexity of what you're trying to achieve uh, direct doesn't isn't like hindered by the language, you could, it's it. Each individual effect is its own problem. Like the language is easy, but any any effect you want to learn whew, requires weeks of research in um, in a lot of situations. And uh, before this, I'd been working on a screen space ambient occlusion shader. Uh, unfortunately, kind of hit a brick wall with that. It's so close to being there, but it's just not quite there, um, which is really frustrating. I've spent so long trying to get that to work, but um. Even if that's not working, I'm pretty happy because now I have a much better overall standing, uh, understanding of uh, just the maths in general. Um, pretty much all of this just comes down to maths, linear algebra uh, especially. And So today I have something a little bit more interesting to show you uh, regarding our good friend, the, uh, the shadows. And it's this method that uh, some of you gurus probably have heard of called cascaded shadow maps and it's relatively this it took me a while to get my head around this I didn't believe that it would work and uh, one of the problems which I kind of anticipated does occur but it's relatively easy to avoid um, by just fiddling a few values around so the general gist of it is you have a view frustum in 3D and the, I guess the reason I'm gonna go through this is because I kind of want this video just to be a little bit of a insightful video into exactly what I'm doing and why it works and what you could potentially do. Um, I'm not going to be releasing this shader just yet. I'm going to be doing a little bit of work getting this um, cleaned up a little bit more. It's very, very bare bones. I've just got this working, so I'm quite excited. Um, and this didn't actually take me too long. Um, the main thing, like I said before, that I was doing is I was using a regular cone frustum um, kind of thing, a frustum to generate the shadow map before, and uh, I realized it's actually a lot easier if you use an orthographic projection. Um, one of the problems that my old shadow system faced was that as things got further away from the sun, um, they kind of veered out as the nature of a cone. Um, things that were further away from the camera cast a bigger shadow. Um, and uh, things closer, well things closer could cast a huge shadow but things closer had less influence on the scene than things further away but then equally things closer to the camera had a much higher shadow quality than the things that were far away an orthographic projection kind of fixes that because it renders everything equally and doesn't scale objects which are further away um, from the camera so some clever people realize that if you take the camera view frustum, so where you're standing and where you're looking 
and split it up into a number of sections and then render a couple of orthographic projections which are lined up with each of those individual frustums, then you can create shadows which don't lose their quality over range um, by having these things called cascades which are just basically like segments, re segment regions so uh, you render things that are near the player at a very high quality um, so essentially what you do is you pull the like light projection near to the player at this point and um, so you get basically get more information about the depth of everything which indirectly or well, directly rather relates to a higher shadow quality um, and then you render multiple other ones so that you can still have shadows on the scene and uh, so I've been trying to implement this and <laughs> I'm not gonna lie it was pretty hard and I had to learn a bit of maths that I wasn't previously aware of. I mean it's all pretty much just linear algebra which is just vectors, matrices and all the like um, but I'm proud to present this uh, so this is my implementation of CSM or Cascade Shadow Maps in Game Maker Studio um, using completely native functions. I'm not using any sort of DLLs or anything for this, just some like maths. I've created a couple of math help functions quite a lot here down the side. But um, so yeah, this is the thing. Uh, I've got three cascades at the moment. You can increase this to as many as you want. Um, the idea is I've got one which renders the entire scene from afar, so that's the one you're seeing at the moment, relatively low quality, but at this distance, who's counting, right? Um, the second one, we've got one in the like mid-range, it's a, actually it's the same resolution, I just drew it at a smaller scale, um, and that's a middle band, so when you're on the ground, uh, you'll probably most likely see objects which are relatively close, but not immediately in front of you in this band, and uh, that one pretty much looks, but I'll, I'll demonstrate, so if I fly in, this is the green band, and as you can kind of see, um, the blue one's relatively low quality, so it's kind of flickering. Uh, the flickering is basically just indicating that there's a lack of data to pull off. But when I get to this green band, it starts looking quite a lot cleaner. And um, yeah, the teapots don't really don't really work. I kind of got a bit of a reputation for teapots. And uh, again, small objects like these fences, you can barely see what they're doing. Um, but these pillars, uh, like their shadows, look pretty decent, all things considered. Um, if I was to go in even further, we get the red band, and this is where things start getting interesting. So, the idea of this is that these sh red shadows are supposed to be incredibly high quality. Um, and uh, I haven't, I'm not doing any sort of filtering at the moment. In my previous shadow shade, I had a PCF filter, uh, which is basically just a radial sweep. So it it softens the edges of shadows by uh, sampling air, like the pixels around the initial point to get a bit more depth information and then blend it as well so that you don't get these jagged edges um, but this is just the raw initial data and um, this is much much higher quality than uh, my previous shadow map mainly because the actual camera that's rendering this close and so close from these three depth projections up here you can actually see where each one is in relation to the thing and uh, there's a little bit more I could do to get even high quality on this because this is still using a relatively large depth range so a lot of values are wasted there's the entire sort of uh, this could go from blue to kind of a reddish color um, like this far one's doing and still be perfectly fine I just need to do a little bit of experimenting with that but this is just the sort of r really bare bones implementation that I've got working and uh, yeah I haven't actually got a proper check on it's just sort of rendering the um, shadow map depth uh, directly onto the surface which is why there's this like, weird fading from object spaces um, so yeah that's this so far and yeah, as you can see you're just doing proper sort of casting and uh, what's nice is that everything is casting a shadow in the right direction so if I kind of move along things don't change their direction depending on uh, depending on where I am in the scene like they did in my old shader um, everything's just kind of static as it should be again as you can see what I was trying to explain about the greens is imagine this is probably a standard player height in a 3D game um, the green ones uh, they're not as high quality as the red ones they're quite a bit lower quality they use a lower resolution shadow map and the uh, they render basically a larger slice I could probably increase the size of those slices a lot of um, implementations in AAA games use four cascades and the general point of that is so that they can just get a little bit more detail in there and a little bit more detailed diversion. As you can see in here, the green ones are 
probably a little bit too low quality but so what I probably do is um, uh, increase the green slightly or maybe even like uh, sh shorten the green slice because I mean it only takes a little bit of distance before you can can't really see the shadows at all it really does depend on your scenario though um, some people like having higher quality shadows everywhere and essentially it still comes down to the old problem where you need to increase shadow map resolution in order to attain high quality shadows um, but there's loads and loads of room for optimization in this for this kind of implementation um, one of the other major things that causes an optimization versus a standard shadow map in this is that you get um, the the size of the orthographic projection is only as large as it needs to be um, it's quite hard to tell but as I rotate my camera these projections up here change and the reason they do that is because um, the orthographic projection is dynamically resizing so that it only encapsulates the exact region that I can see within my camera so in the red region I can see all these pillars and a, a bit of this fence and uh, those well a couple of fences to the side it does render slightly more just to give it a bit of leeway um, uh, but it's only rendering exactly what I need to see so if I come over here you can see that it starts rendering this box but if I'm over here it doesn't it only renders a tiny little bit of the box um, and that's one of the major improvements that you're not wasting any of your shadow maps storing stuff that doesn't need to be stored and to be honest it's completely worth it the maths that you need to do is it's quite complicated but it's not that intensive um, you do need to, I guess the one downside is you can't statically pre-bake these shadows and just render one shadow map once um, this technique relies on all the shadow maps to be constantly updating every step um, but if your engine's set up in such a way where you can do that then it's perfectly fine I mean to be honest if you really wanted to you could get away with not even rendering small objects like these fences in the green and blue bands uh, you wouldn't get their shadows, but um, like in the blue band especially, I can't even see the shadows from the uh, fences in from here. I can only see the shadows from that big block. So, to be honest, you you could probably get away with optimizing even further by just rendering large objects in your um, different bands. And oh, that's a slight glitch there. That's to do with making the... Um, band checks a little bit too small or a little bit too close to their far depth but um, in terms of the actual effect it works and uh, this implementation doesn't rely on the uh, camera position at all uh, the light position at all it only relies on the sun's um, direction and uh, I'm pretty happy with it it's it's got a couple of little issues with it at the moment but um, the complicated bits done which I'm happy with and uh, just to show you one last little thing I'll leave the camera right around here-ish I think yeah here we'll do and uh, I can show you what's actually going on uh, mathematically so this is the view frustum this is the range of exactly what I can see inside the main camera um, and if I go back to this main camera, as I move, as I rotate, if I move, fly up and rotate this, this thing moves around. It's kind of like a capture region. What essentially is happening is uh, the code is just calculating all the corners on this frustum and mapping an orthographic projection to box over that entire region. Um, one caveat which you may have seen is if I come around here, I just need to get the angle right, there's, there's one angle it does it from which you need to be careful at, uh, you can base, ah oh, there we go, so th that angle there um, it actually starts cutting off the render of this box um, because the camera is getting too close to the scene, that's perfectly avoidable by just fiddling a couple of values and um, some of that comes down to designing levels in such a way which complements these uh, cascades but that's quite a, like a large building so in an actual game situation um, it's unlikely that uh, you'd need to increase the shadow much further unless you had some really huge buildings casting shadows 
um, you'd be surprised by how many games actually cheat with their shadow maps and kind of design their levels in such a way which makes uh, shadows friendly because to be honest it's the easiest way to go about it. It's easier to design a level slightly differently and uh, not have to slow down your shader or your process rather than like having to code an alternative method but um, yeah these shadows don't have any filtering at all um, yet I'm gonna be adding some soon um, I can't really give any numbers on performance because I've been doing everything in direct mode but it seems to be running fine if I was to open fraps it would probably be fine unless it crashes so yeah this is running solid 60 FPS um, and I'm rendering not too much but everything's a pretty much being drawn in direct mode so uh, individual draw calls, geometry being generated in real time and so on but yeah that's pretty much this video um, if you have any questions about this or you wanna ask me whatever um, feel free to leave a comment or message me on the GMC my username is Mishmash um, but yeah this is my latest shader and I'm quite proud of it and I hope no one does the uh, that's the classic thing of releasing one uh, the, like a minute before I managed to release mine somehow because I don't think that's happened before but I can see it happening um, but yeah uh, on a side note I'm actually also currently in the process of designing a 3D level editor. I'm not going to actually be making it for a little while uh, but it's it's in the design works. I'm working on it with Orange451 um, who's another GMC user and um, the general idea of it is it's going to be an editor which supports uh, a much more advanced uh, 3D system so it's going to have sort of built-in terrain, terrain painting, uh, geometry so you can place things like walls. Hopefully we want to get in some sort of um, geometry cutting so you can like cut shapes or like doors into walls and things. Um, if not just it's going to have at least some relatively useful tools which should aid with like designing maps uh, but most importantly it's going to include a pipeline so a sort of demo which you can uh, integrate into your games which handles all the rendering for you in an optimal way and also allows you to m like manipulate materials in editor so that you can uh, basically decide exactly what you want your material to do whether you want something reflective something refractive something shiny something matte um, and uh, it should be quite good. It's going to have uh, include with all the pretty much all the shaders I've made in the past, and um, a couple of modified ones from other users, uh, depending on how it works out. But yeah, it's it, hopefully it's going to be quite good. Uh, so far, um, I've been doing some experiments with shaders, and uh, they run pretty well, to be honest. Uh, Game Maker isn't a half bad 3D engine. It is just your bog standard core direct 3D pipeline, and um, the actual performance of 3D really just comes down to how will you implement that? Uh, I guess game is at a disadvantage because there's no sort of formal way of handling uh, different kinds of textures and there's a lot of things that aren't supported but with what is supported you can do quite a lot and you can get away with quite a lot so I'm kind of hoping that uh, a couple of these efforts will lead to a bit more of a widespread use of 3D in game maker and I know some people are going to say this is pointless and why not just use Unity or the established engine yada 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 but uh, to be honest I enjoy the process I, I kind of like this part of making the engine making things work that um, I haven't really been done before I mean it's not like it's not like I haven't been done before but it's like I haven't been done game maker before so yeah um, thanks for watching this video and uh, this should be out relatively soon. Um, I'm going to be releasing this one on the marketplace. Um, not not for very much. It's going to be pretty cheap. But uh, I've put quite a lot of time and effort into this, so uh, I guess it's kind of one of those ways to support my education, if I was to uh, put it in that way. So um, thanks for watching, and uh, see you next time.